The ruin of the ancient city of Tanis in Lower Egypt is, I think, one of the most interesting and enigmatic of historical sites. It's been the seat of many unsolved riddles and mysteries of our past. It has a history that stretches back millennia. Under its many names, it's been kept on the fringes of culture throughout the ages. Once known as the city of Zoan, it is mentioned in the Bible as, yes, those fields of Zoan. And many today will recognize the name Tanis from the Indiana Jones movies, in which it was supposed to have once housed the Ark of the Covenant. Although the Ark wasn't ever found here, and I think that's because we're still trying to locate the map room, Tanis has been the source of some of the greatest finds of untouched treasures ever to have come out of ancient Egypt. Finds that rival or even exceed the much more famous Golden Horde that was recovered from the tomb of Tutankhamun in the Valley of the Kings. Furthermore, there is evidence at Tanis for a past that may well stretch back beyond even the dynastic Egyptians, as it is positively littered with the remnants of massive monolithic stone artifacts and megalithic constructions, whose precision and engineering put their creation beyond the known capabilities and tools of that civilization. Still today at Tanis, can be found the remnants of what might have been the largest and greatest single piece stone statue ever executed by human hands. Tanis has been inherited and repurposed many times over, its objects and architecture reclaimed and defaced by the kings of old. And the clear proof of this process that can still be found today in this ancient place put the truth to some of the greatest fallacies of modern Egyptology. Located several hours drive to the north of Cairo, ancient Tanis is found amongst the irrigated farmland of the Delta near the northern coastline of Egypt. From any way that you view it, there was quite obviously once some massive construction work that took place here, and you can still see many of the huge single-piece granite obelisks and columns lying on the ground in this satellite imagery. Getting out and visiting the site from Cairo does take some effort, but it's well worth the time, as there is an awful lot to see here and it's not a location that is often visited by the types of crowds you will find at Giza or Luxor. Known by its many names, San, Tanis, Ta'an, as well as the biblical Zoan, Tanis's roots stretch back across multiple ancient civilizations. There is evidence here of objects and buildings dating back to the Old Kingdom of Dynastic Egypt, as well as the Middle Kingdom, and then of the bearded Hyksos people, who once occupied and ruled this part of ancient Kemet, before eventually being rousted from Lower Egypt by the pharaohs of the New Kingdom sometime around the 16th century BCE. After which, and for a brief time, Tanis was the capital of all of Egypt. Eventually, the original ancient city was lost to the layers of subsequent civilizations and time, and settlements were built on top of the remnants of this once mighty place, over and over again, and the actual location of Tanis slipped from the collective consciousness of mankind. In the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, it was supposedly buried thanks to a year-long sandstorm. Nazis have discovered Tanis. The city of Tanis was consumed by the desert in a sandstorm which lasted a whole year. While in reality, this sandstorm never actually happened, and it wasn't the Germans who rediscovered Tanis. Its location was rediscovered in the 18th century, and the first scientific explorations of the site took place on Napoleon's expedition to Egypt in 1798. The Indiana Jones movie was set in the early 20th century, long after the ruins had been rediscovered, but the movie did get a couple of details right. For example, the pharaoh Shishak, who is mentioned in the movie, did indeed invade and sack Jerusalem. However, an Egyptian pharaoh Shishak. Yes, invaded the city of Jerusalem around about 980 BC, and he may have taken the ark back to the city of Tanis and hidden it in a secret chamber called the Well of Souls. This tale of the sacking of Jerusalem is recorded in the Bible, and Shishak was later identified as the pharaoh Sheshonk I, whose remains and artifacts were discovered intact at Tanis. While there is no map room at Tanis, nor a snake-filled well of souls, and neither is there any evidence for the Ark of the Covenant ever being housed here, although, interestingly, it may well have been kept at Elephantine Island for a time, a tremendous treasure hoard was found at Tanis in 1939 by French archaeologist Pierre Montet, 
when he located a royal tomb complex at the site that had been untouched by grave robbers. It yielded some incredible ancient artefacts, golden funeral masks, a beautiful silver coffin, as well as a huge array of jewellery, statues, vases and other items from dynastic Egypt. Had it not been for the outbreak of World War II overshadowing this discovery, the find would have firmly cemented Tanis as one of the most famous places in Egypt. Just think about how many people have heard of Howard Carter and the tomb of Tutankhamun. Sadly, Tanis has never achieved this status, despite the incalculable value of the treasures that have been found here. Even outside of this find by Montet, museums around the world have many artefacts and statues that have been recovered from Tanis during the last couple of centuries. If you want to know more about what Pierre Montet found here, I'd recommend a video from Matt at the Ancient Architects channel. He covered it extensively last year, and there's a link to that below. At least to me, of much more interest are the remains of the massive megalithic architecture that can be still seen on this site, and that gives some clues as to the possible true antiquity of Tanis's origins. This once mighty temple complex was truly huge. According to some historical accounts, it spanned an area of some 1500 by 1200 feet, or 450 by 265 meters. Its core complex was made up of megalithic blocks of granite that Flinders Petrie estimated as weighing more than 20 tons each. Think of the Valley Temple at Giza or the Assyrian at Abydos, but just something that is far greater in size. You can gain a sense for just how large some of these structures must have been by taking a look at the writing that's on these big granite blocks right here. What you're seeing is the line in a cartouche, and if this is the size of a single cartouche, you could only imagine how big some of these walls must have been. At one time during the dynastic Egyptian civilization, the entire complex had a gigantic mud brick wall built all around it. A wall that was 70 feet thick, 50 feet high, 3,500 feet long, and was comprised of more than 20 million individual mud bricks. This wall has almost entirely been washed away in our modern time. Today on this site, we can find the remains of avenues of obelisks, columns, sphinxes, and just colossal statues. Many of these artifacts, along with the megalithic blocks and other constructions, are covered in hieroglyphs, and it's from these that much of the mystery and controversy about the origins of Tanis Springs. In Egyptology, it's common practice to date artifacts and even entire sites by what has been written on them. And although this isn't the only method used to build up a picture of history, it's certainly a primary one. While this practice has its place, I happen to think it's also a method that is rife with inaccuracy, as all you are really doing by dating the writing on a box or an obelisk is dating the writing itself. It really says nothing about the origins of the object, only of the writing. This is particularly evident in cases where the technological aspects of the construction of the object far exceed those of the methods used to carve or finish the writing, with no better example of this than the mighty precision granite boxes of the Serapium of Saqqara, with their awful chicken scratch writing that has been used to date them. This is a topic I've covered in some detail in my series on the evidence for ancient high technology, and also in the final chapter of my Serapium series. And rather than repeat myself here, I'd recommend that you check those out if you want to hear more on that topic. Links are in the description box below. This issue of vastly disparate levels of technology existing between the objects and the writing that's on them also exists at Tanis. But here we have strong evidence for another problem with dating objects and sites by their writing. And that's the problem of inheritance, renovation, and the hieroglyphic rebadging of various objects, for want of a better term. These problems get at the core of the enigma of Tanis, as its objects and artifacts have been inherited and then renovated, some of them several times over. This process usually involves chiseling off the older inscriptions and adding fresh ones, dedicating the object to whatever pharaoh was flavor of the week back when Moses was playing halfback for the Israelites. Obviously, this makes the practice of dating and relating objects by what's written on them fairly problematic, to say the least. However, much of our mainstream version of history is built upon just these types of assumptions and leaps of logic. 
Flinders Petrie, who investigated and excavated at Tanis in the late 1800s, neatly summarizes this issue with a passage in Volume 2 of his Tanis reports. Quote, the local mythology of a city is to be learnt from the dedications of its temples and of the monuments adorning the temples. Often it is found that nearly every monument bears a dedication or an expression of homage to a particular god or goddess brought into connection with a particular geographical name, and the name of the city and its local worship can then be identified at once. At Tanis the case is very different, and nothing can yet be considered certain with regard to it. End quote. We're going to examine a number of the artifacts at Tanis, but as we're walking around, I want you to take notice of a specific hieroglyph. It's one that you will see carved into many of the objects here. And once you see this particular cartouche, you may begin to notice it on other ancient Egyptian sites, as well as on various objects in museums. It's this one, the royal cartouche of the pharaoh Ramses II. Also called Ramesses or Ramesu, his throne name can be written horizontally, as shown here, and also vertically, but it will be the same combination of symbols. Roughly translated as Usumat Ra, or the justice of Ra is powerful, chosen of Ra. His name was written in other forms also, but this is the one most commonly found. In fact, you can find it almost anywhere a temple has been built across ancient Egypt. It's certainly a glyph that is found all over the place here at Tanis. It's also prominent at the massive Karnak and Luxor temples. Most of the giant single piece granite statues in those places bear his mark, as does the 800 ton colossus of the Ramesseum, which was named after him. This granite colossus from the same region also has his name carved into it. The great sandstone temple of Abu Simbel, which was moved in modern times, is also supposed to be made in the image of Ramses II. The History Channel recently uploaded a video to their YouTube page in May of 2020 called Lost Worlds – Ramses Egyptian Empire, in which they glowingly review all of the supposed achievements of this notorious king of the 19th dynasty. Today, Ramses is considered to be the most powerful pharaoh to have ever ruled Egypt, called Ramses the Great or Ozymandias by the Greeks. But did Ramses actually build everything that we see at Tanis or at Luxor or at Karnak or at Abu Simbel or at many of the other temples that bear his name? Or is it more likely that he did what so many other rulers throughout time have done and simply inherited many of these objects and structures and then perhaps more so than anyone else in history had the temerity and ego to deface them, to chisel his own name into them in some vain attempt to achieve immortality? Given that we're still here talking about Ramses II, more than 3,200 years after he lived, it's possible that he was onto something. But evidence at Tanis shows the reality of what actually happened. Take a look at this segment of a wall here at Tanis, being shown to me by Yusuf Awan. This was likely once a section of an obelisk that was then repurposed into a wall or some other construction. You can clearly see Ramses II's cartouche, but in this case, and for whatever reason, the work was left unfinished and you can see just how the stonemasons had effectively been writing over older glyphs and replacing them with new ones. Note the blending of the surface into the bird glyph at the end of the block. Ramses was having his name added to an artifact that he had nothing to do with creating. So how can you then attribute this object to him? Another good example of inheritance and the hieroglyphic reclaiming of objects can be found on the beautiful black granodiorite sphinxes that are housed in the Cairo Museum. These are thought to be Hyksos era sphinxes with their full beards and several of these were found at Tanis. These show some incredible polish and detail in their construction. Just look at how the ribs use light to show their effect. Yet the glyphs on and around them have been crudely and imprecisely cut. On the sides and front of the pedestal here, we can again see the cartouche of Ramses II. The writing that is on the shoulder of this ancient artifact, I can really only describe as being vandalism. It mars the immaculately polished surface with the crude work of a chisel and hammer. The hair or the mane of this statue also seems to have been reworked at some point. The practice of altering the style of statues is something that happened to many of them along with the adding of later hieroglyphs. 
I don't want to demonise Ramses II necessarily as the only perpetrator of this practice. While he was certainly the most notorious and successful at it, evidence shows that many kings engaged in claiming older artefacts, in particular the other rulers of Ramses' own 19th dynasty. Notably, Ramses' son, Meren Ptah I, seems to have learned some lessons from his old man, and in some cases he even removed his freshly carved father's name from objects in order to then replace them with his own, the cheeky little bugger. Although this isn't often discussed in the mainstream narrative today, the evidence for the ancient inheritance and renaming of objects certainly didn't escape the notice of the gentleman scholars of our past. Once again, we turn to the writings of Flinders Petrie, who catalogued and analysed all of the hieroglyphs that he could find at Tanis. It must have been an incredible amount of work, and we have him to thank for much of the fundamental research and understanding we have on this site today. In Volume 1 of his works on Tanis, he often and repeatedly reports on examples of where just such reclaiming and defacement of older objects took place. Amongst other descriptors, Petrie named Ramses II a, quote, magnificent egotist, end quote, and he condemned the practice of reclaiming that was so prolific during the 19th dynasty. In the Louvre Museum in Paris is housed a beautiful red granite sphinx that came from Tanis. It's one of a matching pair that were found on the site. Flinders Petrie, when discussing these wonderful artefacts, explains the comedy of the repeated appropriation that they have suffered through over the millennia. Quote, These sphinxes have passed through many appropriations, but they were executed in the 12th dynasty to judge by the fineness of the work and the treatment of the details. On the chest of the sphinx in the Louvre may be seen traces of the so-called banner of a king, with a hawk above it. A fragment of the end of a sickle may also be distinguished on it, and this shows that it must be attributed to Amenemhat II or Usertesen II. The next name is that of the Hyksos Apipi, of which I could only see the inscription on the right side of the base. After this, Meren Ptah appropriated it, cutting out the earlier names with his usual brutality and placing his cartouches on the right shoulder. Finally, Sheshonk I, the great Shishak, occupied the left shoulder with his cartouches and cut a long inscription all round the base. End quote. Petrie also notes, when discussing many of the other artefacts of Tanis, that the later edition of hieroglyphs is often distinguished by its crude nature, in a clear contradiction to the level of craft shown in the construction of the older artefacts that were being defaced. The more modern glyph marks are of an obviously lesser quality to the work that preceded them, a fact that lies in plain sight for anyone who visits Egypt with an open mind to see for themselves. Visit the Cairo Museum and you will see crude glyphs with obvious chisel marks made into countless seemingly perfectly finished and polished ancient objects. A few further examples from Flinders Petrie. When discussing some of the granite blocks at Tanis that seem to have originated in the Old Kingdom, Petrie wrote, quote, It is most likely that the ruthless appropriator of obelisks and statues, Ramesu II, did not object to having a few convenient blocks looted from a ruined temple at Dendera, of which the founder had been then dead one or two thousand years. End quote. Petrie here is discussing two black granite statues of seated females, perhaps the princesses of earlier dynasties. Quote, there are two seated female statues here in black granite, probably belonging to the earlier part of the 12th dynasty. They are princesses and perhaps daughters of Usertesen II, as there is also a statue of his wife in the same material. Ramesu II afterwards took this statue and had all the dress worked up into a ribbed pattern of folds, leaving parts of the old smooth surface at a higher level, just in the hollows under the arms. The hair was also worked into wavy tresses, parts of the old surface remaining also here. The face appears to be untouched, judging by its style and high finish. The outer part of the balls of the thumbs were cut away towards the wrists, apparently being considered too massive and heavy for Ramesside style, although they are rendered wholly unnatural by the alteration. Finally, a long inscription adopting the statue was cut on the back and both sides. The cutting is in the bold, coarse style general in the Ramesside period, quite unlike the delicate and highly polished hieroglyphics of the 12th dynasty on the front of the throne. To try and unify the whole thing and ignore the theft, the titles of the old princesses were repeated on the side by Ramesu II as part of his mother's inscription. 
The body has been broken from the throne, and the base of the throne is lost. Otherwise, this curious example of misappropriation is in good condition. End quote. Here, Petrie is writing about some of the many obelisks that can be found at Tanis. Quote, Another monument of the same period, also appropriated by Ramesu II, is a red granite obelisk. The original engraving of this was only on the upper part of one side, but Ramesu added his name in two columns below that, and on all the other sides of this obelisk. It will also be seen that he erased the names of the older king to substitute his own, and the trace of the older cartouche is visible on the upper part. Altogether, this is a curious monument, and makes us regret the insatiable egotism of its usurper. End quote. And finally, when writing about yet more of the obelisks of Tanis, we can get a sense for the great frustration that Petrie must have felt when faced with the repeated evidence of the ancient defacement of these mighty works. Quote, Among the lesser obelisks in the temple are two which are pamphlets, Ramesu II having erased the older inscription in order to appropriate them. Once again, we must execrate the destructions of the 19th dynasty. End quote. There are many more examples of this type of thing in Petrie's works on Tanis, but I think that I've made my point, which is that it is a well-established fact that Ramses II, amongst several others, regularly engaged in this practice of reclaiming more ancient relics for themselves. How then can we date these objects by the writing that is on them? I think this question should be vigorously applied, in particular, to the technologically advanced and massive stone objects, like the statues and boxes found across many of the sites in Egypt. And when it comes to massive stone statues, at Tanis can be found evidence for what might have been the largest single-piece statue ever made, something almost double the size of the mighty Colossi of Memnon, and that would have positively dwarfed the incredible single-piece granite works found at Luxor and Karnak. The scale and sheer mass of this work would challenge even our own modern capabilities, and I really struggle to perceive just how a supposedly primitive civilization like the dynastic Egyptians ever quarried, carved, or moved such a piece. Although only small fragments remain of this statue, in particular this foot, just take a look at the size of the big toe and try to imagine the epic scale of this statue. Flinders Petrie discovered this piece in the late 19th century at Tanis, and from this foot he estimated the original scale by comparing it to the anatomy of an average man, as well as to the dimensions of two smaller colossi that were still intact. In his book, Ten Years Digging in Egypt, he wrote the following about this statue. Quote, in this way, I examined every block and discovered the fragments of the enormous colossus of Ramesu II in red granite, which must have been about 80 feet high and have towered far above the temple roofs, amid the forest of obelisks which adorned the city. The toe alone is as large as a man's body. End quote. I suspect this is a rare mistake by Petrie, and that I think he meant to write that the foot rather than the toe was as large as a man's body, as from his dimensions the big toe of this statue measures nearly 15 inches long, while the foot measured nearly 60 inches, or 5 feet. In volume 1 of his Tanis books, Petrie reported in more detail on his find. Quote, Taking these scales of proportion, the figure alone of the Colossus would be 796 inches by the pair of colossi, or 993 inches by the modern proportions. As the feet of the pair of colossi are broad beyond all natural proportion, being equivalent to a foot five inches wide on an ordinary man, we shall not perhaps be far wrong in taking the mean of the two results, and saying that the figure alone was 900 inches or 75 feet high, or allowing it to be somewhere between 70 to 80 feet. To this we must add the height of the crown. This, in the pair of colossi, is estimated at 42 inches beyond the top of the head, and would proportionately be 174 inches high, or 14 and a half feet. To this again must be added the base of the figure, which was thinner than the usual scale, being only 27 inches thick. Thus, the whole block appears to have been about 1,100 inches, or say 92 feet high. This was, so far as is known, the largest statue ever executed. Was it a monolith, will be asked. We can only judge by parallels, as it has now been cut into pieces. 
There is the obelisk of Hatasu, 108 feet high at Karnak, and there is the seated colossus of Ramesu II, weighing over 800 tons at the Ramesseum. These are works of much the same magnitude. While, on the other hand, no example is known of a composite statue in Egyptian work, except where introduced as an architectural element and built in small blocks with a column. Thus, vast as the size appears, there is no sufficient reason to suppose that it was not carved in one block of stone. Thus, we have here recovered some notion of what have must been the glory of the capital of the Delta, towering above all the surrounding buildings, a figure seen for miles across the plains, as the sign of the power and magnificence of the great Ramesu, a colossus unsurpassed by any monolith of previous or later times. End quote. To give a rough idea of just how huge this statue must have been, we can compare it to other known works. The seated statue at the entry to the Luxor Temple is roughly 46 feet tall or 14 meters. According to Petrie, this colossus at Tanis would have more than doubled this in height at nearly 100 feet tall. This is significantly larger than even the Colossi of Memnon, which stand around 60 feet tall and are estimated to weigh more than 700 tons each. It would have been roughly the same size as the Statue of Liberty, from crown to feet, around the same size as the renowned Colossus of Rhodes, and both of those examples were hollow and built piecemeal from metal, rather than being carved from a single solid block of stone. This statue at Tanis would have likely easily topped 1,000 tons, and that's after being carved from the original block. In the quarry, I can only imagine that this stone must have been in the territory of, oh, say, 1,500 tons or more. It's truly an incredible achievement, and one that was executed thousands and thousands of years ago. I think the truth of Ramses the Great's achievements lies somewhere in the middle ground. He reigned for a really long time, nearly 70 years, and he reigned over an ancient Egypt that was at one of its heights of capability and power. Undoubtedly, he did build and expand structures, if only to house the various objects that he appropriated, but he likely also commissioned new statues and other objects. Today, in our orthodox version of history, all of these statues at Luxor, at the Ramesseum, Abu Simbel, and indeed many of those at Tanis, including Petrie's giant foot, are attributed to Ramses II. Indeed, they are thought to be statues of him, all because his name is written on them. In truth, however, the faces of many of these mighty granite colossi, particularly those at Luxor and at the Ramesseum, are so perfectly symmetrical that they simply cannot be the face of any human, as has been demonstrated conclusively by engineer Christopher Dunn. Simply put, we're just not as perfectly made as were these ancient works of high technology and art. No human is as perfectly symmetrical as are these statues. See my video on precision if you're looking for further detail about this, but in summary, the precision that is evident in these statues far exceeds the known capabilities of the dynastic Egyptians, and it certainly exceeds any tools that we have from them that exist in the archaeological record. It's just not possible. So based on the evidence for the rebadging of artifacts and the evidence that's in the technology of their construction, we have to search for new explanations for the origins of these works. One possible answer is that many of these massive granite objects were inherited from an earlier time. They were found sacred and awe-inspiring by the dynastic Egyptians, much as we find them to be awesome today. They inspired the culture and the art of dynastic Egypt, and they were claimed and written on by hugely ambitious rulers like Ramses the Great, and we have direct evidence for this practice. This fact is rarely discussed in the orthodox history world today, I think perhaps because it opens up too many questions. If the mighty colossi of Luxor and Karnak aren't, in fact, statues of Ramses, then who made them? More importantly, when were they made? When you combine lines of investigation like these along with the undeniably advanced technology that is evident in the construction of these objects, it threatens to topple the house of cards that is our current version of history. There's a subtle point here that I want to make, but it's an important one. It's that we really cannot separate the lost builders of such objects from the dynastic Egyptians. I still think that the Old Kingdom of Egypt is one of the greatest contradictions in the modern narrative of human history. 
Just how did this old kingdom pop up out of nowhere, out of the Stone Age, without iron tools, without the ability to quarry granite, yet immediately they supposedly created some of the greatest architectural feats the world has ever known. Feats in the Old Kingdom pyramids, in the massive granite temples, columns and other objects. It just doesn't make any sense, but when we put these facts into the context of inheritance, of cataclysm, and of longer timelines, we can begin to understand them. Interpreting history will always involve conjecture and guesswork, so let me engage in a little bit of that and lay out the scenario that makes the most sense, at least to me. I think that it's very likely that many of these objects and structures came from a time before the cataclysm, from a civilization of high capability that was almost entirely wiped out and is today lost to us. We 100% know that this cataclysm happened. It was called the Younger Dryas, and it took place around 12,800 years ago. I'm sure many of you know this. And it's what wiped out much of the megafauna that were living on the planet at the time. And it also put a savage dent into human populations. I think it's possible, even likely, that some small parts of this lost ancient civilization survived the cataclysm to pass some of their knowledge on, even if their capability evaporated along with the megafauna. I think this knowledge is reflected in some of the truth that is contained in so many origin stories from religions and cultures around the world that speak of cataclysms of fire and flood, of ancestors barely surviving this and being forced to begin again. I also think some of this advanced knowledge has survived in the enigmas of the ancient and highly accurate world maps that predate many known civilizations. I also think that the culture of this lost civilization is reflected in the astonishing trend of pyramid building that we can find evidence for all around the globe today. Further, I think evidence for their technology and their capability has been preserved in the massive precision works of megalithic granite architecture and objects that again we can find everywhere from South America all the way to Egypt. And I think that millennia later, after mankind had been blasted back to the Stone Age by the Younger Dryas Cataclysm, we eventually rose up again. And in the case of ancient Egypt, we rose again with one hell of a legacy, more so than in any other part of the world. The dynastic Egyptian civilization inherited objects, structures, and even knowledge and history as they connected themselves to this time of the gods that they called Zeptepi through their own timeline and their own historical records. And these are records that we arbitrarily dismiss as just simply ancient myths today. They used these inherited objects, they formed culture and ceremony around them, even if that was not their original intended purpose. That is ultimately what they became. The style and shape of artwork, statues, boxes and buildings flowed directly into what the dynastic Egyptian civilization evolved into. These ancient, sacred objects, their style and the culture of the original builders drove the entire dynastic Egyptian civilization. Over thousands of years, ultimately this inheritance was claimed as their own by rulers like Ramses II, driven by ego and visions of godhood. And today we're left trying to interpret this whole mess by attributing these objects to whoever it was that last wrote their name on them. So in this way, I think it's very difficult to separate dynastic Egypt from the original builder culture. Rather, I think we should be seeking to extend the timeline of Egypt far further back to them, with a long dark period of thousands of years after the cataclysm, before humans had the numbers and capability to rise into civilization once more. Now there's probably a whole other video's worth of exploration that I could and should do on this topic, and perhaps I will, but in general, the more that I research and investigate these areas of our past, the more that I'm convinced we're entirely wrong with our assumptions about the beginnings of human civilization. Yet, at the same time, our academic establishment seems to be becoming ever more dogmatic in their insistence that there's just nothing to see here, and anyone who doesn't agree with them are just alien-chasing, racist pseudo-archaeologists. I'm not even making that up. Those are 100% the terms being thrown around by supposedly reputable and tenured professors. It's honestly getting a little tiresome to hear the same old logical fallacies and straw men arguments again and again. 
Some of you may recall that in a live stream last year, I deconstructed just such an attack on Graham Hancock in one of the mainstream archaeological journals, and how authoritative establishment-driven websites like Wikipedia are used like a bullhorn to propagate their dogmatic proclamations about the truth of history. Links to those streams are below if you want to see them. The reason that I mention all of this is that Tanis happens to be an excellent example of just such an authoritative approach to history by the mainstream, in particular when you read the Wikipedia entry for it. This entry comes across as having literally zero mystery here at all. Apart from being very brief, the article simply states that Tanis is unattested prior to the 19th dynasty, and that the earliest buildings on the site date to the 21st dynasty. It further says that anything on the site that is datable to before this time was simply just brought there from other sites. I think this is laughably far from the truth, and you don't have to go very far to show it. Tanis is undeniably older than the 19th dynasty, although it was the rulers of the 19th dynasty, particularly Ramses and his son Meren Ptah, who scrawled their names all over it. Once again, we have to turn to the archaeologists of previous centuries in order to get a less blinkered and authoritarian approach. Flinders Petrie was convinced that Amenemhat, the first king of the 12th dynasty, built a temple here, as there are many objects that reflect the style of that dynasty, as well as a red granite colossus said to be of him at Tanis. This statue was, perhaps predictably, later reclaimed by Meren Ptah of the 19th dynasty by carving his own name onto it. When writing about this statue, as well as the red granite columns found at Tanis, Petrie said, quote, The first piece of work as yet known to belong to San is the red granite colossus of Amenemhat I, the first king of the 12th dynasty. The greater part of the lower inscription has been hammered out by Meren Ptah I in order to substitute a barren repetition of his own name in the rudest style, only the small strip of old titles being left in the middle. It seems certain that Amenemhap I built a temple here, as his statue was doubtless placed in some large building, and there are many fragments of columns of red granite which appear to belong to him. It is impossible to assign them to the Ramesside or any late period. End quote. The signs of deep antiquity at Tanis continue back even further. Petrie also found evidence for buildings that may have occurred in the Old Kingdom, in particular, a number of blocks and inscriptions that seem to trace back to the well-known Pepi of the 6th dynasty, although, given the many renovations and layers of subsequent building, he does admit that this is far from a certainty, and that it's possible that these granite blocks were imported from older sites and reused in later times by Ramesses. In my opinion, the origins of Tanis likely stretch far further back in time, even to pre-cataclysmic times, but it will be almost impossible to ever really know for sure when this place was originally built. I think that Tanis, and perhaps more than any other site, has been repeatedly renovated, reclaimed and reused, which has muddied up the waters of its origin. There is likely much more yet to find here. In fact, recent ground-penetrating radar scans have revealed further construction in deeper layers at the site, and even though this exploration is happening very slowly, new discoveries are still being made in this area. Today, the ruins of these ancient and priceless monuments are left resting in the sand, as a reminder and distant echo of the glory and achievement of the mighty structures that once stood here, rivaling any of the far more famous sites of ancient Egypt. Although almost nobody knows it, Tanis is one of the most important and relevant historical sites that connects our civilization to the lost times of the ancients. Much like the lost labyrinth at Hawara, its legacy deserves better of us, and rather than being dismissed as a footnote in the achievements of a hugely ambitious and egotistical ancient king, Tanis should be celebrated and investigated as one of the cradles of civilization, and as a remnant of a long forgotten and lost era of human achievement on planet Earth. Hey everyone, I hope you found that to be interesting. Uh, that's a real cracker of a statue at Tanis, isn't it? It must have been just a gigantic uh, piece of work back in the day when it was when it was intact. Uh, you know, touch wood, I really hope to get back to Tanis uh, this year and take another look at it. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to getting back to Egypt uh, pretty soon. 
I had cut quite a bit of text out of this episode. Uh, I'm going to move that into a part three of my uh, evidence for ancient advanced technology, and that'll be an episode that focuses on construction methodologies, and in particular how you know statues and objects like this were moved, were potentially moved around. Uh, things like the stone of the pregnant woman at Baalbek, the trilithon, the the unfinished obelisk. I really think it's these extreme cases that we have to explain and account for if we are presuming that some primitive ancient civilization moved these around without the aid of, of forms of advanced technology. Uh, and I don't think we've adequately done that uh, to this point. There's not really a lot of point in arguing about you know blocks that are two ton or 10 ton uh, in, or 20 ton even in size, there's plenty of evidence that suggests that ancient civilizations were capable of moving those around, but it's rather these extreme cases that we need to account for uh, if we're going to say that, well, this was all done by some you know, primitive civilization using primitive methods, and I'm quite skeptical uh, that that's the case. I hope everyone out there is doing well and surviving in these strange times that we're all living through. Uh, this channel's approaching 100,000 subscribers at this point. Uh, I'm really grateful for all the support that everybody's shown me. Thank you to everybody that subscribes to the channel and watches the content. Uh, I do want to say just a, a huge thank you in particular to the people that support the channel through the value for value model. Uh, there's lot, if you're interested in doing that, there's lots of ways that you can, you can do that. They're all outlined on my website. It's unchartedx.com slash support. Uh, so my name is Ben and this has been Uncharted X and I will see you all in the next one. Cheers.